or we're just going to digitize his brain, download it into a computer, maybe put it in a robot. These are things people are talking about as the potential future of humanity. So what I'm going to talk about is the end of adaptation. A time where we don't have this random element of change in ourselves as beings. A future point we may very well be working toward. And I'm going to talk about some deeply held assumptions we all have inside us as people who live in a modern technological society. Some of them we don't even realize we have. They color the way we view the world. They're, they're essential and how we structure our lives, and we don't even know they're there. And, and there's huge ramifications for the way we think, and not all of them are positive. So I referred to George Grant, Time of History. George Grant, Canadian philosopher, he really highlighted and explored and delved into the thoughts of Nietzsche. He thought that Nietzsche had the clearest view of the modern soul. He had thought most deeply about what it means to be a modern person, and his thought was essential. How many here have read about that? He's kind of, uh, you know, it, it, he's considered abstruse. you got to be a real geek uh, in a philosophy department to be reading this. But he thought so deeply about the way we live our lives, even today, and this is over 100 years ago he wrote that his thinking is essential. And he pointed out something. He said, we have a conception of history as modern people that is completely different from any civilization before us. We have a completely different view of history. Every other civilization thought of history like this. A circle. Eternal. Events keep repeating. There's a continuity to it. How do we think of history? A line going up, a cro magnum man turning into a modern human. We think of history as a, pro as a progression, as progress. And, and there's, an, there's an incredible difference between those two views. Um, we also think of history in a way that completely separates us from nature. The birds have history. The rocks have history. That's not the way we think of it. We have history. We are the human beings. And history is the story of our existence completely separate from all others. Is that a good thing to be separating ourselves from nature? To be thinking of ourselves as separate from that rather important part of our existence, our whole existence. We, we see ourselves as separate from evolution. The very process that brought us into, be, into being, we now see ourselves as potentially controlling. And when we often do control, even today. <coughs> the other thing that is, is really essential about that whole idea of history is that it is future-oriented. Tomorrow is going to be better today than today, and the day after that is going to be better than the day after, and, and so on and so on. We take it as a given. Give it. We're progressing. You know, we, we came up out of the water, you know, and, and then we landed on the moon, right? We are, <laughs> we are moving somewhere, okay? If you think about it, if the, his, if, if the future is so fascinating and so valuable, does that not devalue the present in some sense? Does that not turn our eyes away from, from important questions about how we are right now? If our focus is, what's next? Oh, it's the biggest news of the day. There's a new iPhone. It's progress. Okay? We are, we are future junkies. Okay? We can't get enough of what is coming next, that anticipation. It gets inside us, that whole world view. It, get, it gets into us such that we're not thinking about 
who are we now? Are we living the right way? It's, who do I want to become? That's the exciting thing. How am I going to recreate myself and become something bigger, better, more advanced? That whole conception is just essential in, in, in who we are right now. And we don't even realize it. It, it causes a great focus upon technology and advancements in that area. I remember the first space shuttle disaster. It was in high school, it was announced, I didn't believe it. So I said, mean, you're kidding. I had such faith in technology that I could, I could not conceive of that machine. I mean, I thought several years earlier, you know, shuttles being piggybacked on, on a jumbo jet, and we're going to the stars, and, and that it was foul. It was shocking to me. And, and, and more and more, we rely on technology for so much. Most of our lives are mediated through screens. I've asked that these were turned off in this presentation. We think that more efficient technology is necessarily superior technology. Does anyone here themselves or know someone who spends many hours a day in the virtual world as opposed to the real world? <laughs> Making pancakes with the kids. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> I, I'm not pre I'm guilty. Uh, and I'm just waiting, waiting for an email to arrive. Someone to communicate with me. Right? It, it's ridiculous. And, and there's, I look at that and I see, I see this kind of gnawing loneliness. I'm, I'm sure the education system, uh, spoken by a previous speaker, is fantastic for some, but it also sounds very isolating, right? As, as, as painful as it was to get beaten up every night, <laughs> getting off the bus, I was being socialized. <laughs> That's our concept of morality and of importance now. 
and no one else had that before us. What they had was God, or in ancient Greek times, the heroes were called upon to do magnificent things, but they weren't trying to change the structure of what was. They were trying to, to restore an eternal order, a, a great order that already existed there. There's a fundamental shift to say, guess what? You get to decide. And not everyone can make that decision well. Uh, Nietzsche referred to some, he looked forward, uh, not in a hopeful way, but in terms of anticipating some reactions to that void. So some people will become what he called last men. Uh, sexist, sorry, last people, um, to paraphrase. <laughs> and, and it's a long story as to why he calls them that, but he said, these people will basically want comfort and entertainment. They will not try to think of what are the eternal, permanent, essential things in human beings. I just want dinner and, and, and a sitcom. All right? <laughs> and, and he said another thing that people can latch on to is they can become nihilists. And they can become so frustrated with the lack of apparent meaning, meaning that he said they would rather will nothing, which is destruction. They would rather will nothing, be destructive, than have nothing to will. So rather than have no meaning, they'd rather destroy. Uh, any, any headlines over the last you know, 10, 11 years or so uh, resonate when you hear that? Mass shooting, the terrorism, this sort of thing. We're always trying to make sense of this. It must have been politically motivated. It must have been insane. Uh, you know, maybe the high school shooters just felt a dearth of meaning. There was nothing to fill that void, nothing to tell them. What is it good to do? What is it good to be? What is worthwhile? We used to have those answers. And, and you can look at a current state of having to create them as being incredibly Free. I get to decide. I, as an individual, get to decide what is important and what is good and what is virtuous and what I should pursue. Or it can be terrible. The end of adaptation. What would it mean for us to completely dominate nature and defeat death? I've been thinking about this. Imagine this alien society. Excuse me if it's a little depressing, but I imagine this alien society conquering death, and then they stop procreating. I mean, they have billions and billions of people on that planet, and none of them are ever going to die. Where are they going to put more? What's the motivation for continued creation? They have a static population that's going to go on indefinitely. Perhaps they give up human form. What kind of lives would they lead? All of these thinkers that I brought to you tonight, Nietzsche and George Brand, they didn't want to be cynical. They didn't want to be pessimistic. They wanted to challenge people. And I'll end with that. They challenged people to think about these issues. What is our purpose? Is there even a need to try and come up with a collective purpose for humanity? Should we keep focusing upon the future? Should we accept technological progression as true progress? Or should we think through these things that, that really inform our lives and perhaps take a different approach? Anyway, I'm very pleased to have been able to speak with you. Thank you for listening.